Hello, all of you out there. And I do mean all. The numbers are mounting vertiginously as I speak. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's a beautiful day in London, and I hope it's equally nice wherever you are all over the world, no doubt. And welcome to ESG Investing. This is hosted by London Business School's AQR Asset Management Institute and our Center for Corporate Governance. And we're very pleased to have you all with us today. I'm Richard Portis. I'm the academic and academic director of the AQR Asset Management Institute, and I'm professor of economics at London Business School. So we'll begin by examining whether ESG investing actually works and how to go about it best, informed by academic research, of course, that's what we're here for. Our first speaker is Alex Edmonds, who is the academic director of the Center for Corporate Governance at London Business School and our one of our professors of finance. He's also the author of the book, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. And this was featured in the Financial Times list of top business books of the year for 2020. So over to you, Alex. Thanks so much, Richard. It's great to be here and to partner with the AQI Asset Management Institute on this really important topic. And thank you to everybody for, for joining. So as Richard says, I'm going to talk about ESG investing, does it work, and how to do it. And the first place I'm going to start is to actually define ESG investing. And you might think, well, that's somewhat surprising that we all know what ESG investing entails. But in fact, my definition of it will be somewhat different to definitions that we typically think about. And to do this, I'd like to start with an example of what some people thought was really bad ESG. So let's cast our minds back around 11 years ago to April 2010. And Public Enemy One, number one at that time, was a CEO called Bart Becht. So he was the CEO of Reckitt Benckiser. And you might wonder, well, what had he done in order to attract such negative attention? Was this a product recall? Was this a big environmental disaster? Was this a safety issue within one of the factories which led to some workplace injuries? In fact, it was none of those things. Instead, he was in the news and the subject of public anger due to his pay package. So it was announced that he had just um, been paid £90 million in just a single year. And £90 million is a lot now, but it was even more back then. And this led to a lot of anger, just arguing, well, how can somebody be paid so much money just for running a company? And it wasn't a complicated company, like a financial company, right? Even though people were still angry with the financial crisis a few years ago, people at least recognised that maybe a financial firm is complex to run. But Reckitt Menkiza, that was a company that made household products things such as Dettol antiseptic, Strepsil's throat lozenges, and Vanish liquid. So surely running this is something that almost any executive could do. There's no special talent needed to flog items like this. But as Richard said, right, what we want to do when discussing these topics is to look at rigorous evidence, and that involves looking at both sides of an issue. And I'm sure many people in the audience will um, have this view, is that fair pay, it's important not just to look at the amount, but how good performance it was, and in particular, long-term performance, because that's a key component of ESG investing. Now, there's a couple of ways to look at things, right? So what actually happened one year afterwards was that Bart Beck, likely due to all of the shame that he'd received in the intervening year, particularly for a publicity shy workaholic, he ended up unexpectedly resigning. And on the day of his resi resignation, the market value of Reckitt Benckiser fell by £1.8 billion. That was orders of magnitude greater than the pay that he had received in that one year. And you might think, well, that doesn't really prove anything, because it might just be that the market was duped. Right, because Bart Beck was paid so much, maybe the market was fooled into thinking he was some kind of superstar. And so the market just overreacted on his departure, even though he didn't actually add much value. And you might think, well, how can a CEO add so much value? He or she is one of hundreds of workers within a firm. But in fact, we could look at what happened in the few years after he left. 
So while in the four years prior, revenues, operating income, and net income had all grown significantly, over the next few years, they all declined. And if we look at the overall measure of shareholder return, because this is on ESG investing, what investors care about is long-term total shareholder return. Well, what we can have is even ignoring dividends, Reckitt Benkisa had created £22 billion of value since it was formed through the merger of Reckitt and Coleman and Benkisa. And it was the fourth best company in the FTSE 100 in the past decade, so after looking at a long-term horizon. Now, clearly, all of that £22 billion was not just due to one person. But if you were to say, well, even 1% of that value was due to the CEO, then that might be quite something which is quite significant, £220 million. Suddenly, the £90 million doesn't seem so large anymore. And also what we care about ESG investing is not just shareholders, but also wider society. But there's many other um, ways in which Reckitt being keys outperforms. They created a lot of value to customers, to employees, to the environment, winning a lot of environmental awards. I don't have time to go through all of these now. But the point of this example is to highlight, well, we can't just look at one specific issue, such as high pay. Instead, we want to look at, well, was this deserved by long-term performance? And in this case, it actually seems that it might have been. And also, we looked at that £90 million. Actually, that was not £90 million received in a single year for a single year's work. Instead, £87 million out of that was because he had been given shares 10 years ago. Those shares had gone up in value. And it was because of the good performance of Reckitt Benkiza that he was able to cash it in for such a large amount. So that's an example of where people thought it was bad ESG when actually it may not have been. And the mindset that many people had was that the value that a company creates is given by a pie. And so the amount that executives take is given by the blue, and the amount that investors and society take is given by the orange. And we often think that ESG investing involves splitting the pie differently, making sure executives get less, and therefore there's more to go around for everybody else. And that's indeed why one and one component of ESG investing is to clamp down on pay. But actually, what this example suggested was that the pie was not fixed, right? The 90 million that Bart Beck got was not at the expense of everybody else. It was, a, in fact, a byproduct of creating a lot of value over 10 years. And if indeed pay is fair, it should be linked to the long term value that you had created, which was the case for Reckitt Benkeys. So if that is not necessarily an example of bad ESG, what is an example? Let's cast our minds back even further, back then, 2010. Let's go all the way back to 1981. Let's say you are an investor in Kodak. Now, what happened in 1981 was Kodak's main rival, Sony, had just released the Mavica. So this was the first ever um, electronic camera. Now, if you're Kodak, how do you choose to respond? Well, Kodak could have chosen to respond. It had ever, every opportunity to respond. In fact, Kodak had got a patent for the digital camera six years earlier. Now, we know what digital cameras look like today, but in 1975, they weren't so elegant. This is what it looked like. Now, it's not like what we have today, but they certainly had the ability to use that patent to develop something that could be commercialized. But they just didn't bother. Right? They indeed had an internal study where their own head of market intelligence predicted that digital would replace film, but that would take 10 years, and they just couldn't be bothered to do something with a 10-year payoff. Why did they need to? Because sales had just cost $10 billion, nearly all from film. Why didn't they just sort of pick the fruit of their very, um, very productive forest? Why did they want to bother planting some new trees when there are so many fruit to be fixed? And um, as this University of Pompeii Fabulous case study says, the company just never got around to developing the technology because the, move, the money to be made from the traditional business of photography was so much bigger. So we now know how that film ended. 
right? So Kodak went bankrupt in 2012. It was a disaster for society. So it was a disaster for investors. It was worth $31 billion in 1997. But as ESG investors, we care about wider society. It was also a disaster for employees. Kodak had been worth, had, had employed nearly 150,000 people in 1988. But why do I highlight this example? And why do I have this plus recommend keys at the start of my talk? It's because the latter is rarely thought of as an example of irresponsible investing. Right? No executive lined their pockets. No investors got rich. But the fact that executives and investors also lost out, that's of no consolation to the 145,000 employees who lost. Let me repeat this. We often think that irresponsibility is investors and executives taking from everybody else, right? So you're overpaying your CEO, or if a company announces record profits, then it gets really negative media headlines, as if those profits are at the expense of everybody. But in fact, the most irresponsible action that a company can take is not to innovate, is to coast and to sit on the status quo. Indeed, the most a company can, a CEO can steal from her firm is not through stealing, through paying herself too much, but through stealing through inaction and allowing the entire pie to shrink. So instead, what I view responsible investing as being about is, yes, absolutely, part of this is a fair split of the pie. We want to make sure that society benefits from fair wages, fair taxes and fair prices, but we also want the pie to expand. So as responsible investors, that might involve engaging with a company in order to shake them away from such complacency like Kodak to ensure that they create value for society. And if as a byproduct, investors do well and extract and get high dividends, and the CEO does well and is well paid, that is not bad ESG. That's just a consequence of creating value. OK, so the importance of this, so the, the punchline of these first two stories is to rethink our notion of ESG investing. It's not just about a fair split of the pie. It's about growing the pie through innovation and excellence and shaking companies sometimes out of complacency. Now, the question is, well, if that is what ESG investing involves, does it actually work? And again, as Richard suggested, what we want to do is to look at this with rigorous academic evidence. And the important thing is to stress the um, word rigorous. Why? Because of this concern of confirmation bias. So people would like to accept evidence if it confirms what they would like to be true. For example, if you were a climate change denier, people might latch onto that uncritically. And this is particularly a problem with responsible business or responsible investing, because people would like to believe that it pays off. And therefore, if there was even a flimsy study showing that it paid off, people would lap it up. And indeed, this is what we saw last week, actually. There was on my Twitter feed, I don't know, on my LinkedIn feed, it may have been on some of yours, there was some new study being heralded for being proof that ESG investing always works. So one investor who I deeply respect, right, this is not to call anybody out, but this was um, just an example of the excitement about the study, said, is there anyone left on the planet who thinks that sustainable investing requires a sacrifice of return? If so, you want to send them this new study, suggesting that if you don't believe in this, you're not even on this planet, you, you've got some alien views on this topic. And this was heralded by people saying, I've seen this study shared a few times in the last several days, how compelling the results are, very broad data, thorough analysis, clear correlation. Another said it's infallible facts. Another said it's robust proof. When actually the analysis was unfortunately very weak, it contains a lot of studies which were not even published in peer reviewed journals or were published in very low rank journals. And why does that matter? because they could fail to control for other factors, which could both be correlated with responsibility and also be correlated with superior performance. So there might in fact be no link between responsibility and performance, 
but another factor causes them both. For example, just last year, people were heralding how ESG performed well in the pandemic, when in fact, much of this could be due to just energy performing badly, which is bad ESG, and tech performing well, and tech typically has good ESG scores. So it might have just been a tech energy difference rather than something which is driven by ESG. So clearly all of us here, we're on this webinar because we care about ESG performance. We want it to work, but it does require us to look at the evidence critically rather than believing something because we know it to be true. I listened to a podcast recently where a CEO of a very responsible company was um, being interviewed, and this is a CEO I really respect, and he was offering advice to the listeners on how to run their businesses more responsibly. And he said, we need to be passionate and positive and ignore those cynics and skeptics. But in fact, cynics and skeptics who might be highlighting, well, actually, responsibility doesn't always pay off. Another word for cynic or skeptic is diversity or diversity of opinion. And if indeed there is some evidence suggesting that sometimes responsibility might pay, not pay off, we need to be careful of this and we need to acknowledge it rather than just saying, well, we can be passionate and positive and ignore it. And this was the topic of a, a recent TED talk I gave at LBS called What to Trust in a Post-Truth World about the importance of being rigorous with the evidence, particularly when it's on a topic which we would like to believe. So let's apply this to the concept of ESG. And I'm going to start with the G of ESG, even though the E and the S is what people typically will, latch, what will find most interesting, mainly because uh, actually some of the later speakers will be focusing more on the E and the S, but also because there's more data on the G, so I've got a bit of a firmer ground. I'm going to start with perhaps the most famous G study, which was one of the studies which made governance investing much more mainstream. And this is why the large investors today, not just specialist ESG funds, will care about corporate governance as well as the EMBS. And this is a paper which looks at various mechanisms that companies can put into place to defend themselves from shareholders. For example, a staggered board, means that the board of directors is not up for election every year. Instead, only one third of the directors is up for election in a single year. And what that means is that, well, if the board is underperforming, any activists cannot come in and immediately kick out the board because only one third is up for election. So even if the activist won all of the available board seats, he or she would only get one third of a board, not a majority, not be enough to kick out the CEO. And there's many other things you can put into place in order to reduce the amount of oversight that shareholders have. Now, you might think these 24 ways that you can defend themselves from shareholders, that's outrageous. That just leads to a lack of accountability. But there is a flip side. What you might think we should protect ourselves from shareholders. Because one of the prevailing narratives is, well, if we're allowing shareholders to intervene in a company, they could encourage short-termism, like they're all about the quick buck, extracting dividends, demanding share buybacks. So we actually do want these protection mechanisms to allow the CEO to focus on long-term value and not to be distracted by these short-term pressures. So you might think, well, which is it? Does this um, protection help companies' long-term performance, or does it hurt? Well, what we do as academics to try to evaluate this is we try and look at the evidence. And here, the evidence, at least in terms of this first paper, seemed pretty unambiguous. So what this study found is it took companies which were well-governed, which don't have these protection mechanisms, and found that those companies beat poorly governed companies with those protection mechanisms by eight and a half percent per year over this nine-year period, right? This was which is hugely significant. That is a significant amount of annual outperformance. And that might not be surprising to some of you who believe in the importance of governance, but it actually is in contradiction to a lot of the policy changes that we're seeing right now. So there is a lot of call to reduce companies from investor oversight under the grounds that this is something which is going to lead to short-termism. 
and we've seen this um this study into changing the uk listing rules maybe to allow companies which have these protections to get a premium listing okay so this is one of the studies which highlighted the importance of good governance and made it mainstream but there are some important twists and here's one of the twists so this paper which came out eight years later said that actually governance might not matter in every situation so what they were arguing is that let's take a competitive industry so if there's a lot of industry competition then that's going to force the ceo to create value anyway so even if she is protected by a staggered board and a golden parachute that doesn't matter because the competition is going to force her to maximize value so they said well only in the non-competitive industries maybe like utilities do we need governance because that's where there's the tendency to slack off and indeed what they found was that when they rerun the study then you only found governance mattering in the non-competitive industries and that's important because some of us might use these ESG factors as a tick box and exercise right if you don't tick the governance box then you're excluded but actually what this highlights is in some industries it might not actually matter and even in some industries it might backfire so just here's an example so pemstar is a contract manufacturer it went public in 2000 and at the time ibm was its largest customer and it had uh, this long-term relationship they teamed up together to open this manufacturing operation in Brazil and to share their knowledge with each other. Now, there was the concern that when PEMSTAR went public, then small shareholders, not realizing the value of this business relationship, would have pressured IBM to try to milk it by increasing prices. And so what they did was they put in a number of takeover defenses, and in fact, five of them, to try to prevent any short impressions. And what this large scale study found was that in general, when a company goes public, its valuation is lower, the more protection mechanisms it, that it has consistent with the earlier findings. However, when they found that if the company has a large customer, a dependent supplier or a strategic alliance, something that it needs to cement and protect from short term pressures, then actually these protection mechanisms which we often view to be bad governments, are actually good and improve the valuation going public. Okay, so that's one component of ESG, which is um, one component of the G, which is shareholder rights. Let me go through one other G factor before moving to the E and the S. And that is executive pay. And so I focus on this because this is one really hot button issue. If there's one thing that actually gets the general public upset about companies, it's the outrageous amounts that CEOs are being paid, hence the Bark Beck example. And a lot of focus now is on the pay ratio, the ratio of CEO pay to worker pay. You can even get apps telling you what the ratio is, encouraging you to boycott companies when this pay ratio is too high. And this is based on some view that a high pay ratio is linked to worse company performance. Why? Because um, it's just a sign of really bad corporate culture. And indeed, a few years ago, there was a corporate governance inquiry in the House of Commons, which I was testifying at. The witness before me referred to evidence finding that firm productivity is negatively correlated with a pay ratio. Again, when the pay ratio is too high, employees feel demotivated and they underperform but in fact what the witness had chosen was a half finished study the finished version was actually out and after going through peer review and correcting its mistakes what they found was completely the opposite result well actually higher pay ratios were correlated with higher company performance why perhaps because of this record ben keyser idea that if you've performed well and if pay is linked to performance you will get high pay and so this is striking because what this suggests is how we must be rigorous with the evidence and as richard highlighted it's almost always possible to find any study to support any viewpoint even a half finished version when the finished version shows the opposite so if indeed the pay ratio doesn't matter well, what does matter in terms of pay? It's sensitivity of pay to performance. 
So here's one very good study, which looked at companies where the CEO has a lot of shares in her firm. So she has a lot of skin in the game. So pay is tied to performance. And there's a simple strategy. If we're to buy companies where the CEO owns a lot and short companies where the CEO doesn't own much, then you'd earn four to 10% per year over a 22 year period. Now you might be skeptical because you might think, well, is this correlation? Or is this causation? Right on the one hand, you might think, okay, maybe high equity causes the CEO to maximize value because she has skin in the game. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe the CEO knows how well her company is going to perform. And if she expects the company to perform well, then she's going to ask for more shares today. If she knows that the company is going to be underperforming, she's going to ask for cash. So it's future performance that causes shares today, rather than shares today causing future performance. So how do they get around that? Well, they look at settings in which incentives are more likely to matter. So those are settings where there's weak product market competition, weak governance and few institutional owners, because then the CEO is likely to slack. And indeed, what they found was that in those settings, you find the stronger effect, which suggests that it actually shares that cause better performance rather than the other way around. Now, just giving shares is not enough because those shares may just be um, sold in the short term. So the other thing which is important is the horizon. And in the interest of time, let me not talk about my own paper. Let's just talk about the second paper here. What these authors found was when the company puts in long-term share schemes, not only does performance go up in terms of profitability, but also various measures of societal value also go up. The company becomes more innovative, makes more patents, higher quality patents, and also various CSR dimensions go up, importantly, including employees. So what that suggests is that the best way to make things better for employees is not necessarily to cut the CEO's pay and redistribute it, but in fact, to tie her pay to the long term. Because if a CEO knows her pay is linked to the long term, then she will indeed invest in long term value. And that's backed up by one of the S studies that I'm going to talk about. And this is one of my own papers, and that's why, which got me interested in ESG investing around 15 years ago. So, what I wanted to look at is employees. So, why did I choose employees? There's so many other dimensions of ENS that you could look at, but I chose employees because they're material in almost every organization. And this materiality idea, I'm going to come back to you shortly. Also, I chose employees because I have a very good measure available, which was available from 1984. Because ESG is a pretty new thing, many of these data sets might have only been around for the past 10 years. And if I showed you that ESG outperformed between 2010 and 2019, you might think, well, that was a boom time for the economy. Maybe. Right now, in a pandemic, ESG doesn't matter. Companies should focus on profitability. So because I started in 1984, I had things like September the 11th, like the financial crisis, so I could check that this outperformed in bad in times as well as good. And what I found was that the companies on this list outperformed their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28-year period which is 89 to 184% cumulative. And so this addresses some concerns that, well, if companies treat their work as well, they're being fluffy, they're distracted from the bottom line, they're giving too much of the pie to employees. Instead, this suggests that if you're investing in employees and maybe other stakeholders, then you're actually creating more value, growing the pie, and therefore investors will be better off. And the most important thing here for investors was how inefficient the market was, right? Because something is good for firm value, that doesn't mean that we as investors should invest on it because if everybody knows it and it's in the price, then we can't generate higher returns. But what was striking was it takes the stock market four to five years before it fully incorporates the value of employee satisfaction. Why? Because many investors overlook it, perhaps because it's something which is intangible. So my final section, that before the Q&A, let's think about sort of how do we then put this into practice. So the traditional way in which ESG investing or responsible investing was enacted was through exclusion or screening. 
So you have a criterion, a red line, that a company cannot cross. And if it crosses it, if it's in a sin industry, or has low board diversity, or maybe has a high pay ratio, we're excluding it. And then that gives your admissible universe. And then out of this admissible universe, you will then choose the companies to invest in. And you will choose them only on these financial dimensions. So what this means is that ESG is only the foot in the door. So if you don't cross the red line, then you are admissible. But then once your foot is in the door, then you just forget about ESG. You just look at traditional financial factors. There's a lot of problems with this. And I'm sure many of you will know the first two of them very well. One of them is that these quantitative factors are easy to manipulate. A second of them is it ignores this materiality thing that I've touched on, but I'm going to focus on a bit more later. I'm going to focus more right now, right now, though, on the bottom two, because that's linked to sort of the, the specific angle of ESG I introduced earlier. Is that some of these ESG factors might focus more on pie splitting. Are you paying your workers enough? Are you paying fair taxes? That is absolutely important. But it might not ca capture pie growing, innovation, some of the best ways in which we're serving society. And similarly, some of these measures will focus on do no harm. Again, are you polluting the environment? That is very important to be aware of. But in fact, some of your main societal contributions might be actively doing good. Right? When Vodafone launched m this mobile money service in Kenya, which lifted 200,000 households out of poverty, that might be something which is not captured in most ESG dimensions, even though it created a lot of value for society. So what we have now is the idea of ESG integration. So what is meant by this is that we consider ESG factors alongside financial factors. So it's not that ESG is the foot on the door and then we just think about finance. We consider both of them together. And one question that some investors ask me is, well, what weight do we put on ESG versus finance? But I think that's sort of the wrong question. I don't think there's a formula or a weighting scheme that you can use. Let's say when you choose a job, right, you care about salary, you care about um, the company, your colleagues, the on-the-job training and so on. We don't have a weighting scheme to sort of size them all up, but we're still able to make the decision. Similarly, when you consider a stock, even if we forgot about ESG, we look at management quality, balance sheet strength, financials, outlook, competitive positioning. We have no weighting scheme, but we somehow find a way to combine all of those things together. And so this is something which is called a net benefit test. And putting my practitioner hat on, I'm on the Responsible Investment Committee of Royal London Asset Management. What we ask is, does the company provide a net benefit to society? So this looks at things holistically. Are there bads that the company does? Sometimes they might cross some of these red lines, but this might be outweighed by some of the good. If you launch a mobile money service to lift 200,000 people out of poverty, that might actually outweigh underperformance on certain issues. So this considers excellent. So this is why I started my talk with the idea of responsibility as growing the pie, actively creating value because that is something which is often ignored by some of these ESG frameworks, even though it adds a lot to society. The final thing I'm going to get do before we go to the um, Q&A is to think about this word purpose, because this is something which is often equated with ESG, but it's not often formally defined. So sometimes people view purpose as being all things to all people, tick off as many SDGs as possible, or serve every stakeholder, just like this statement. But if you think about the word purpose, it doesn't mean altruism. It means focus. Right? A purposeful meeting is one with a clear agenda. If I do something on purpose, I'm going to do it deliberately. So a purposeful company, and one that we should invest in as ESG investors, is one that's focused and targeted. It knows why it exists and the specific role that it plays in the world. There's two sub points for this that I'll end with. One of them is this idea of comparative advantage. It is not the responsibility of every company 
to solve all of the world's problems. Yes, we face a lot of issues, climate change, now diversity and inclusion, automation, resource depletion, and it's tempting for a company to, like to take a stance on every issue. When in fact, a company has a responsibility to focus on the issues that it has most comparative advantage in. For example, let's take Coca-Cola. It has this initiative called Project Last Mile. And that project makes um, vaccines and medicines available everywhere in, Afri in Africa, including the difficult last mile to a rural school or a hospital. And so why does it do that? Because its expertise is logistics. It's able to make Coke available everywhere. So that's a great way in which it uses this comparative advantage. And you might think, well, if it's good at logistics, why doesn't it transport books? But medicines, they need to be transported cold. And being a drinks company, Coca-Cola has expertise in refrigerated transportation. What does it mean to be um, focused on materiality, the thing I've alluded to many times? There are all those stakeholders that you might care about in my first bullet, but you will face trade-offs, right? So if you are to close a polluting plant, you're going to be helping the environment, but hurting workers. So what materiality says is when there are trade-offs, who is first among equals to drive that trade-off? And this leads to the final study that I'm going to show you. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this. This is the materiality map of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. This goes industry by industry and highlights who are the most material stakeholders in a given industry. In the first column, extractives, it's the environment. In the second column, financials, it's social capital. So yes, climate change is the order of the day, but at least your direct effect on it is not that high if you're a bank. Instead, what we want to avoid is poor selling practices and product labeling. We don't want to be in a Wells Fargo fake bank account scandal or a payment protection insurance scandal. So yes, climate change is extremely important, but maybe even more material for you as a bank is to make sure you are first rate in terms of selling practices and product labeling. And what the study finds is that if you take the ESG data set from MSCI, which is perhaps the best known data set, companies that do well on all of these issues, they actually don't beat the market. They only beat the market by one and a half percent per year, which is insignificant. However, when you redo this with a materiality lens, what you find is that the companies that do well on the material issues, but scale back on the immaterial ones, they do beat the market by 4.83%. And so this is striking because in contrast to the idea that everything that's ESG will pay off, this highlights that it's only the most material dimensions that will pay off, which highlights the importance of not just taking these ESG metrics at face value, something that the second paper is going to highlight. Okay, so thank you very much to everybody for their attention. So as, as Richard mentioned at the start, I wrote this recent book on ESG investing and the goal of that was to try to take this academic research which I think is very practical and useful for investors but written in very academic ways and make this accessible to an, an investor audience so I hope that that will be a resource for some of you who are interested in ESG investing but let me hand back to Richard uh, for the Q&A thank you so much for all of the questions which have already come and thank you Alex for a terrific introduction to our event today uh, it's uh, already excited quite a lot of response from the audience. We have lots of Q&A, uh, Q, or we have lots of Qs. It's for you to provide the A's. Uh, and I'll start with the first one that came in uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, it would be good, by the way, those of you who, uh, uh, who can, uh, to signal who you are, because we might even identify some of our students. Who knows? Uh, but this first question uh, says, regarding executive pay, how do we know it's due to the CEO who brought value and not because of other factors like the industry in which the firm is operating? Uh, like regulation, consider what's happened with Uber uh, and the change in the regulatory environment. Um, how, um, uh, how do we look at this? As, and I would add for, perhaps um, uh, monopolistic positions. We know that the degree of concentration has been rising very considerably, certainly in the United States and the UK. Uh, over the past couple of decades, um, uh, suppose that a lot of this outperformance is due to firms exploiting their growing monopo monopolistic positions. How do you how do you respond to that? 
first to say to acknowledge it and say it's a great question also i'd like to loop in patrick o'sullivan's question he highlights carillion as being an irresponsible company so in carillion the ceo was on track to receive i think a, a three digit million payoff and people think well that was not due to his performance but the housing market being buoyant why because of low interest rates and the government's help to buy scheme nothing to do with carillion in particular so there is one view which is that we should always link pay to the industry so this is indexation and bengt holmstrom who won the nobel prize a few years ago argue his, his most famous paper was to highlight the importance of relative performance evaluation however there was a, a bit of a flip side to this and in fact um, i'm doing a um, study on executive pay right at the moment um, partly supported by the aqr asset management institute so thank you for that where we're surveying non-executive directors and investors on how they set pay and some of them will argue actually you don't want to index the performance why because of this idea of fairness so let's say right now we are in a pandemic and in the pandemic investors are suffering and employees are suffering but if we were to insight the CEO and say, well, she shouldn't suffer because that's a, it's the pandemic's not in her control, that's just not seen as fair. And so on the flip side, if you are suffering in terms of bad times, you should also be benefiting in good times. So what I'll say to answer this question is, whatever the company has chosen to do, they should be transparent about it, and it should be symmetric. So it could be fair to say, we are going to expose the CEO to industry conditions, so if the industry does well, she will benefit from that. But if the industry does poorly, she will also lose out. It cannot be one sided where you benefit from a buoyant industry, but you're insulated from downturns. There might be other companies where you might say, we're going to insulate you completely. So they won't benefit from the upside, but similarly, they would not suffer in a downturn. So it has to be on both directions. I've got a question from Aditya Sheth who says, in studies analyzing the successes of ESG, uh, how do you control for the fact that companies that focus on being socially and environmentally responsible tend to be run by better leaders? Um, so how much of the success of the ESG investing in terms of returns is simply due to more competent people running the firm? Uh, this is a great question, Aditya. So um, I'll put it in, in sort of economist parlance. So what you're suggesting is, is management quality is an admitted variable. Right, so we're trying to correlate two things, A and B, ESG and better performance. Maybe there's an omitted variable, management quality, which causes both. And you could actually level that accusation at my own study on employee satisfaction. Maybe a great CEO causes her employees to be happy, and that great CEO causes the company to perform better. So how will we try to ad address that? So there's a couple of techniques. So what I did in my paper, and I didn't mention it when I gave the presentation, was I looked at the future earning surprises of a company. What do I mean by an earning surprise? Well, every three months in the US, um, you release your earnings. But before you release your earnings, equity analysts like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley will forecast what they will be. And they will take management quality into account because these equity analysts talk to management all the time. So what I found was that those companies were doing even better than what analysts predicted. And so that suggests it's something over and above management quality that was driving this. Second thing you can do is you can look at a shock to ESG, which is not linked to, to changes in management. So there's research by Caroline Flammer at Boston University, who looks at what happens when shareholders pass a proposal to um, improve some ESG dimensions, for example, to have a supply chain human rights betting policy. And she looks at what happens when these proposals are put in. They have nothing to do with management quality. She uses this technique called regression discontinuity, but I'm not going to bore you with that right now. There's a lot of questions. What she finds is that that also not only improves ESG performance, but also financial performance, which also tries to address the submitted variables issue. Let's go to where you started off your talk with executive pay. Uh, and one uh, attendee asks, do you think there is any problem with executive pay? Let me just add on to that, uh, the headline yesterday or today that um, uh, 18 hedge fund bosses got 35 billion uh, returns, personal returns last year. Uh, is that due to creating value? Uh, what is it that, um, what is it, uh, as I say, maybe there's no problem with that. What do you think? 
Okay, yeah, there's, I think, at least two problems. I, well, there's one I was going to think of, and the second prompted by Richard's comments. So I think the main problem of pay is not so much the level or the ratio, but the horizon. So there are some cases in which CEOs can be well paid for delivering very short term performance. So it might be that you're given this um, incentive scheme, which just evaluates performance based on, say, one year. So instead, in those cases, what we want to do is to change the horizon of performance to being many years down the line. And one positive move was the UK Corporate Governance Code in 2018 extended the minimum horizon from three years to five years in terms of equity holding. So I think when there is a problem, it's not the level. A level which is justified by long term performance is fine, but it's the horizon on which it's based. But your second concern might be, no matter how well the CEO's perform, let's say she's created value for, for 10 years, 90 million is just outrageous. And certainly the hedge funds that Richard Tite uh, mentions, that's also outrageous. But that is not a problem linked to just executive pay, right? It's a problem with any scalable skill. With a hedge fund manager, nowadays, because you're managing so much money, even if you're only beating the market by a little, you can create a huge amount of outperformance. And let's talk away from business, compare JK Rowling, to Jane Austen. It'd be hard to argue that J.K. Rowling is more talented than Jane Austen, but now, because the book industry is so scalable, you can sell all around the world and make movies, any small differences in talent will lead to a huge amount of value creation. And so what this suggests is actually the problem with executive pay is a problem globally with any scalable skill, and this scalability only becomes more apparent within um, the, the move to online working, like Joe Wicks can get a million people coming to his workouts. And so I think this should be addressed by governments through high income taxes on high incomes, right? Because if inequality is an issue and there is big social implications of inequality, it's not something which is just contributed by a few CEOs or a few CEOs and head fund managers, but anybody with a scalable talent is able to reap good rewards now that we are moving into this online world. And so the government should address that with high income taxes. Filmmakers have made a lot of money out of Jane Austen films in the past decade or two. Um, just a little bit late for her. Too bad. <laughs> um, now, um, we have, in fact, you partly answered, I think, uh, one of the questions, um, well, question by Anna McDonald about looking at the totality of pay during the executive's tenure rather than just one year. Um, uh, Philippa Ferreira, says, I believe that tying executive compensation to ESG KPIs will make a company perform stronger in this dimension. Alex, what's your perspective on this and how would you do it? Thanks, Philippa. Actually, uh, my colleague at um, the LBS Centre for Corporate Governance, Tom Gosling, is together with Claire Hayes-Geimer, the executive director, doing a study actually on the research on linking executive pay to ESG targets. I actually have a, a, a rather nuanced view on this, is that even though I'm a big supporter of ESG, and I'm certainly a fan of ESG disclosure, I think when you link pay to that, you might cause some unintended consequences. So there's already quite a bit of research on how you, when you link pay to something like earnings, that causes cuts in R&D and changes in accounting policies to meet the earnings target. And that could also be the case with ESG. For example, even if we have an ESG dimension that we think might be good, let's say new job creation, that could lead to the company focusing on creating more jobs, rather than improving the quality of existing jobs or improving the corporate culture. If you think about something like carbon emissions, right, which we should all care about given climate change. In fact, when we at Royal London ran our portfolio through this um, global warming tool, we found that semiconductors were the worst contributions to, to emissions, even though semiconductors will power the solutions to global warming and have a lot of other beneficial factors. So when you set um, a, a target and you pay according to it, there's this danger of hit the target, but miss the point, right? We can look at what's just being measured and sort of manipulate that and improve that dimension and ignore a lot of these other dimensions. So if that's not what I'd ad advocate, what would I advocate instead? It's the idea of tying pay to long-term value because this Flammer and Van Sol study that I mentioned earlier shows that when you do that, not only does the CEO improve long-term profitability, but also performance on these ESG dimensions. Why? Because if she knows that she needs to make the company do well in seven years time, she absolutely needs to take her stakeholders seriously. Uh, we've only got a few more minutes, but uh, time for another couple of questions, possibly. 
Uh, one from Stefano Torti uh, says, take MSCI USA versus the MSCI USA ESG leaders. Uh, the ESG underperforms there, he says, by a sizable margin over 10 years. Many ESG advocates always focus on Europe and ignore the US. Um, what's your take on that? Thanks very much, Stefano. And th this is a really important. This again addresses the myth that ESG will always pay off, even though um, that's something that um, David Blood and Al Gore wrote about in a recent Wall Street Journal article. In fact, I didn't think that it was that it was clear cut even in Europe. So um, there was a study of ESG investing by Luke Renneborg, um, Terhorst, and Zhang, which looked globally add ESG and SRI funds and found either an underperformance or at best just market performance. But again, I think why they look at that is they look at ESG on this basis of this box ticking exclusion issue, right? Are you in a certain industry or do you have too high a pay ratio? When in fact, I say ESG is a lot about innovation, actively creating value, and a lot of these qualitative dimensions that we might not be capturing in traditional ESG metrics. Uh, a related question, uh, you, perhaps you partially answered it, but not fully, uh, is from Manan Goleka, who says, where do you draw the line between traditional investing, that is focused on profits and shareholder returns, and ESG investing? If we term growing the pie as ESG, wouldn't it lead to the risk of greenwashing? Thanks, Mena. I think the greenwashing is, is a major issue and there's so many incentives to do it because there's so much interest in ESG right now. And so this is why I, I ended with the idea of comparative advantage and materiality. So I think a company that tries to greenwash is one that jumps on every social issue or the order of the day even if it has no comparative advantage in doing so. So let's say donating to charity, right, should a company do that? Well, not necessarily. So let's say both Richard and I are employees of the company. Instead of donating to charity, it could pay us higher wages and we could choose what charities to support. A company is no better placed to make charitable donations than Rich and I. We can choose which charities. Whereas if you think about sort of the um, project last mile with Coca-Cola, that's something that's uniquely placed to do. So I think when we want to evaluate these companies, if they are doing something outside of the core business, you might want to think, well, do they actually have comparative advantage in, do this, in doing this? Is this something that they can move the needle more than any other company? Because if not, maybe they should just be paying higher wages or giving higher dividends. I wish we at London Business School had lots of money that we could give to charitable causes. Uh, but uh, uh, let me get on to another question. Uh, and that is, um, uh, do you have any thoughts on the current rise in sustainability linked bonds and green bonds? Cons considering the subjective nature of measurement, do you see any for uh, foresee any problems there? Um, I, I, I do. And I'm, I, I'm going to just tie in also the question of, of Candice Bockley, which says, um, do you think ESG is getting too much traction? I, I'm concerned with this in that people can just put a label in it and call it ESG, even though, as I've mentioned, these things are much more nuanced. So actually on the, on the book's website, what I'm doing is I'm covering new academic research, which came out since I finished it, which I think is important. So one is Florian Berg and Roberta Rigobin's paper, which is to be discussed later. But the latest thing I did, if I can put this in the chat, was one which looks at the um, sort of fossil fuel industry, which is seen as being dirty. It would not be in green bonds. And what it finds was that actually they produce more green patents than nearly every other industry, right? So if you think about, say, a fossil fuel company, it's got a lot of brown assets, but a lot of investment opportunities in renewable energy. And if we're going to say, well, let's sort of not invest in this because it's seen to be dirty, we're actually depriving capital of perhaps one of the biggest solutions to, to climate change. So absolutely, we can't ignore the brown stuff. We would like these companies to have a transition plan, but the sort of concern of calling something green or brown, this encourages a lot of binary thinking. It can have a lot of these unintended consequences like depriving capital also to semiconductor companies. Well, I'm afraid uh, we will have to stop here. Uh, we've hit our time limit, uh, but you've covered a very wide range, uh, Alex, and you've been very responsive to those questions. Unfortunately, there are several, several really good questions that we haven't been able to get to, but, um, but you've, uh, you've, oh, you've outperformed, Alex. Thanks, Richard, and apologies well, for the question we didn't get to, but, but. Whatever index, okay. 
But if, if people want to ask them to me, if you just drop me a note on LinkedIn, I promise to get back to you on any other questions that people have. And I didn't get time time to really appreciate everybody's engagement. Very good. Thanks for that outperformance. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. Right. Bye bye.